You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. Hey, we're here today with Jennifer M. Morton talking about the complex issues related to upward mobility and the role that higher education plays in helping teenagers improve their lives. We're going to be looking at some sociology research about how the parenting practices of working class and middle class families differ in some surprising and interesting ways. We're going to see some areas where entitlement can actually be a good thing and how we can think about entitlement in a new way and what aspects of that might be important to teach our kids or pass on. We're going to talk about code switching and how teenagers often have to act very different in different social situations that they find themselves in without moving away from their core values or the things that really make them who they are, that are non-negotiable. How can we help them figure out what those things are and how to stay true to their deepest values? We're also going to cover values affirmations and what some research at Stanford has revealed about values affirmations, uh, how values affirmations can actually improve academic performance for years and why that is, how that works. We're going to talk about how to be real with kids about the challenges that they're going to be facing in their life and in the coming years without scaring or discouraging them too much. And we're going to see what all of us can do to help mitigate the costs associated with attending college and moving up in the world for young people. Some really important and interesting topics coming up today and some very fascinating research to cover. Really looking forward to getting into all of that and a whole lot more. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Talk to me about Strivers and how you got interested in this topic. Yeah, so the way I got interested in this topic was really through teaching. I taught for many years at the City College of New York in the uh, CUNY system. And a lot of my students were first generation, first in their families to go to college, or students from working class families, from low income families. And, you know, as a professor, I was trying to get to know my students and their struggles and and how to help them. And there was definitely, you know, issues around sort of academic preparation, you know, some students who go to CUNY have gone to public schools that maybe didn't have as many resources as, you know, school uh, students who go to more affluent schools. Um, But a lot of it actually had to do with the challenges that students were facing in being caught between two worlds, caught between trying to pursue their own educational and career ambitions. And at the same time, feeling very connected to their homes, their families, their communities, and playing really critical, important roles in those communities. Mm-hmm. And feeling like it was it was almost impossible to do it all. Yeah. Um, and so I started to notice that, you know, one of the biggest challenges that my students were facing wasn't that, you know, they didn't have the motivation to want to succeed on campus. It's not that they were like off party. Or, you know, some of the, I think that the ideas that sometimes we have about um, college students, but really they were, you know, working a lot of hours, they were helping their families with babysitting or elder care or uh, doing stuff around the house or helping a disabled parent, you know, they were just doing a lot. Um, on top of trying to go to college and, you know, do well in their classes. And I really came to just kind of admire how hard my students were working to try to reach for the American dream. But at the same time, just sort of astounded at at the situations they were in and feeling, Mm. you know, that it was almost sometimes impossible for them to manage all of the demands that they had on them. And so that really led to me thinking more about the ways in which our conversation around higher education and upward mobility 
misses this really critical part of students' experience, which is that students want to lead good lives. And leading a good life is not just about getting a college degree and getting a good job. That certainly can be a part of it for many students. But for sure, many of yeah. them, leading a good life is staying connected to family, mm -hmm. uh, feeling a part of a community, you know, uh, caring for the people that you love and being able to help them. And students were making really difficult trade-offs between yeah. pursuing this thing that we tell them is going to transform their lives, right? Higher education. And at the same time, wanting to really be good, um, you know, good children uh, to their parents, good siblings, good neighbors. So I wrote the book trying to bring this to light in the conversation that we have around higher education, which often focuses yeah. on financial barriers and academic barriers, but they're just like a part of the challenges that first generation and low income students who I call in the book's drivers face. And that's what a lot of your book centers around these trade-offs that um, students engage in when they are deciding whether or not to attend college and how to navigate as they go through that process. And you refer to a lot of these as ethical costs. What are those? I think of the ethical costs as costs to these goods in our lives that make our lives meaningful and valuable to us, right? So ethics yeah. and philosophy is the study of how to lead a good life. And, you know, mm -hmm. part of leading a good life is having uh, relationships with the people that you love, feeling connected to one's community, being a good friend, being a good parent or a good, you know, child, uh, being a good sibling and so on. And what I saw was the students were having to sacrifice some of those aspects of their lives for the sake of upward mobility, right? And so right. in particular, I talked to strivers who had quote unquote succeeded, who had done well and gotten those college degrees, gotten those nice jobs, and who felt a lot of regret about what they had given up. In some cases, their relationships with their families were strained. In some cases, mm -hmm. the families were really supportive, and those relationships weren't necessarily strained, but the striver might feel like they weren't able to be there for their family in the way that they wanted, or maybe they yeah. feel that they are now somewhat disconnected from their community of origin. And so when I was talking to strivers, I heard a lot of people being proud of what they had accomplished at their journey, um, but also a lot of regret mixed in with that about what they had given up in the process. You talk in the introduction about entitlement and how we often think of it as a negative thing, but that in some ways, a certain level of entitlement is important or um, can be beneficial. So before I taught at City College, I was teaching at Swarthmore College, which is you know a highly selective liberal arts college. Yeah. And at Swarthmore, the student population was different, right? And so the student population there were the sorts of students who had made it through K through 12 schools in such a way that they were now in a good position to get into this highly selective college, which meant that they had... Uh -huh you know, already learned to navigate a lot of the challenges they confronted. They might come from more affluent families. And I think very importantly, they kind of had a sense of agency over their own educational journey. Yeah. And so I remember, you know, I was like a very young assistant professor. They didn't really know how to teach, which I sometimes tell my students now, I'm like, you don't realize sometimes when your professors are not actually taught how to teach when they're in graduate school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that explains a lot of why you see so much bad teaching at the college level. Uh, but I did not know how to teach. And I was sort of doing that thing where you just, you know, kind of lecture and then you let the loudest students talk, you know, the ones who are most prepared for the course or maybe who are most confident. 
And, and I had a, a couple of students who were like that and really dominated the conversation, um, I think to the detriment of some of the other students. Mm. And this young woman in the class came to talk to me um, at my office and she said, you know, this class isn't really working for me right now. And I, you know, at first I was taken aback. I thought, wow, okay. Oh. I mean, I knew it wasn't working. You know, she wasn't telling me something right. I didn't know. But I actually okay. really appreciated the way that she did it. She did it in a very respectful mm. way, but it was still, she was asking for something to change, for something that she, yeah. you know, she wanted the class to be different because she was right. It wasn't really working for all the students in the class. Yeah. And that kind of attitude that some of the students there had it's just so different than the ways that many of my city college students navigated that institution. Yeah. I don't think in the 10 or so years that I taught at city college, I ever had a student come into my office and say something like that. Right. It's been a part of that, right? Because yeah. their experiences of education are just so different than students who grow up in more kind of affluent and privileged positions and they see education um, and educational institutions as serving them right? Yeah, as yeah. places where they have a voice and they have a say in what happens. Right. Whereas many of my students at City College were used to educational institutions treating them in ways in which they, you know, maybe they don't feel like they had a voice. They had to jump through some hoops, but they didn't feel kind of empowered to take control over their education. And so I think that difference, you know, we, we sometimes talk about it as entitlement, but I think in some contexts, it really is the ability to make sure that you're getting what you need. Yeah, right. And advocating for yourself yeah. and not not assuming that there's something wrong with you, but that this isn't working for me. Exactly. And also knowing when it is something that it's important that you advocate for and knowing when you're just being yeah. too much, right? When you're like <laughs> asking for someone to cater to your own specific needs. And of course, you know, yeah. as, as parents, you try to figure out how to teach your kid where that boundary is. But I do think that sometimes, you know, I saw this at CUNY, the institution in some ways might not be serving the students as well as it could. Um, and but mm, students don't yeah. feel empowered to really demand more. And I think in some ways that makes sense given their experiences of public institutions that maybe have low investment, you know, public education is constantly being defunded, public higher education as well. And so it's not necessarily rational sometimes for students to demand more, but yeah. we need to hear it when students are dissatisfied and feel like educational institutions are not giving them the resources they need to succeed. And you have some little story later on in the book about a student who was in your class and um, I guess you convinced him that he needed to practice and learn how to speak up more and share his ideas, I guess. And you sort of made a plan with him about how he could come prepared to say things in class. Yeah. And um raise his hand when he had something to say and you could call him so he could start practicing that skill and getting better at it. And I just think that's, that's so important and how we can teach kids to do that and um, to instill that is an important question. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, there are ways that professors can definitely organize their teaching to make sure that they're communicating to students that they're open to helping them develop these sorts of skills. Yeah. And students can also going to the professor's office during office hours or just saying, I need help with this, or I'd like to be able to, um, you know, speak more in class. How can we work together to make that happen? Um, and I've had yeah. other students that have asked me that. And, and, you know, we'll talk about different ways of doing it. Sometimes you tell students, well, maybe you want to write down some things that you want to say before you come to class about the reading or the topic. And then, you know, sometimes that gives you the, the confidence you need that, that you have it written down so that if you're in the middle of talking and you forget, which is the, the fear the students have, right? That they'll like raise their hand and they'll start talking mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're so nervous they'll forget what they're saying, just having it written down can help or 
I have students who have said, I just need you to give me a little bit of time, but by the end of the class, I'll say something and I'll like signal in some way that I'm ready. So then I make sure to prioritize that student if many students are raising their hands, you know. Uh, they yeah, might yeah. be taking a lot of for them to raise their hand unlike some other students. So I think all of that stuff really comes down to the educator having a good relationship with the student where they you know open yeah. those lines of communication and that can be hard when students are in really large classrooms you know right. that was one issue that kept coming up when i was teaching at city college towards the end of my time there that our class sizes kept getting bigger and so it becomes mm -hmm. really hard for me to know about you know a class of 40 students like exactly what different students might be needing what kind of support i can provide it just becomes a bit more difficult thing to manage than when students are, are in smaller classes but also it strikes me that it's so beneficial to let your professors know that that's something that you want to get better at or that you're working on and to have that conversation and work that out with them so that then it, when you do when you do raise your hand and you have something that you're ready to say then they prioritize you like you were talking about or that they can sort of help facilitate you to gain that skill instead of feeling like you're on your own or you just have to sort of work it out yeah, that is a really, I think, important part of the difference sometimes that class background can play to how students mm -hmm. experience college. It's that some yeah. students haven't had the practice in figuring out how to ask for help from an adult, feel comfortable yeah. asking for help, um, not interpret it as a problem with them if they need help. Yeah. Whereas students who might come from more affluent backgrounds or from college educated parents might just have parents that have already had those students practice those sorts of skills yeah. and become comfortable with navigating institutions like college. And so we see this in some of the empirical literature that uh, low-income students sometimes have a hard time asking for help or have a hard time developing mentorship relationships with professors or even feeling connected to the other students, right? So asking uh, somebody else in your class for help, that can be a really valuable uh, skill that can help you do well. But if you don't feel connected to the other students in the class or, or it's difficult for you to make friends in that environment, then it's going to be that much harder to find those sources of support. So that's what we see that students from who are first in a family to go to college or come from low income backgrounds have a harder time with that dimension of college. And that can really also throw another challenge into their path through higher education. There's another difference that you talk about, um, and this is the research of Annette Leroux, mm -hmm. who studies parenting differences between working class and middle class families. Yeah. And I thought this was really interesting that working class parents give their children more freedom and allow them to spend more time playing with other children in the neighborhood and with extended family members. And as a consequence of this, those children tend to be more deeply connected to extended family and to other children in their neighborhoods. Whereas middle-class children are more likely to have these really, really regulated schedules where you're kind of shuttling them between extracurricular activities and they have more sort of uh, transactional relationships, I guess, or surface level relationships and not such deep connections with uh, extended family and close friends. What you see in the research, in Ella Rose research, is that working class families, as you said, give their children more freedom, more time to hang out with extended family members. This is both born out of necessity, right? So if you yeah. maybe can't afford all these extracurricular activities, then you have right. a really demanding job or maybe multiple jobs, right? You're going to rely on your extended family, on neighbors and other people to help you with child rearing. And of course, we've yeah. seen this 
during the pandemic in various ways. And it's not, I think, that affluent families or more privileged families, you know, that those children don't necessarily develop those deep connections. It's just that their lives are geared towards this goal of what Annette LaRoe calls concerted cultivation, right? It's the thought that you're going to do piano and tennis and swimming and, and you're going to spend a lot of time on these extracurriculars and a lot of your life is kind of regulated around these goals that are down the line, right? Like getting into a good college or developing, you know, important skills or talents. And so what ends up happening is simply you might just not have as much time yeah. to be around say extended family or around people in your neighborhood in the way that you would if you had more unstructured time. And there's a trade-off here, right? So the kids who get all these extracurriculars and have these more regimented schedules do end up benefiting in all sorts of ways from that. And the you know, being the sorts of kids who have the resume that gets them into a good college. <laughs> right. Um, they might develop they can play the piano. talents that benefit down the line, but there might also be some trade-offs for that. Mm. You know, one of the things that she talks about in her book is how one thing the researchers noticed as they were visiting these families is that some of these upper middle class kids would often complain about being bored if they had no activity plans, right, whereas right. the working class kids didn't complain about being bored because they were just used to kind of like figuring it out themselves, right? Entertaining themselves. Entertaining yeah, themselves right. with like neighbors or other kids around or figuring something out because they weren't used to having their time scheduled by their parents. And so there are yeah. definitely trade-offs on either end of the parenting spectrum there. Another interesting thing that I found was looking at the support. And you talk about this research from Sarah Goldrick Rabb, and it's looking at uh, how financial aid doesn't really consider the contributions students might be making to the family's subsistence, and how a lot of times students from low income families are making contributions to the family's well being before going to college. And it's funny because I feel like we just have this view that, you know, the family takes care of the kid and the family is contributing to the child's life, but we don't really think about how the child actually can contributes back to the family. And it's especially prominent in these lower income families. That's exactly right. And so the whole financial aid system in the United States assumes a kind of picture yeah. of family life and of a nuclear family where both parents contribute to a child's college education and they've been yep. saving and, you know, right. um, yeah. but it really doesn't work for a lot of working class families where it might be a single parent household. It might be a multi-generational household. It might be a household where, as you said, the child contributes financially to the family or, you know, the child or teen at that point, right, might be doing a lot of caretaking. They might be taking care of younger siblings or younger cousins. They might be taking care of an older grandparent. And so when that child or that teen at that point is considering going to college. That's yeah. not just a decision about their own financial future. It's potentially a big burden on their family mm -hmm. if they're not able to work or not able to take care of people who are taken care of before. And so it really means that they're potentially putting their family in a worse position, you know, not even taking into account the cost of attending college, which is obviously a huge barrier, but even just not being able to contribute to the family is a big uh, cost to that family. That's something that we don't often talk about. And Sarah Goldrick Robb, um, who's at Temple, she's really done a lot of great work and kind of reminding us in higher education and the public in general that the population of students who are going into college has changed, right? So at some point in time in the past, not a lot of 
people were going to college, right? It was a very limited yeah. sector of the population who came from more affluent families, who just had different backgrounds and, and we had different background assumptions. But now there's been an increase in college access, which is, you know, great. But also that means that students from all sorts of backgrounds and families are going to college and some of them have challenges that the whole college financial aid system admission system is kind of now playing catch up yeah. and trying to figure that out and so yeah i've heard of students i've had who are on financial aid and when they get that first big check at the beginning of the semester some of them like turn around and just send it to their families mm. um, and then they have to figure out how to pay yeah. for college, you know, by working or taking on loans or doing something else because their families uh, need the money. Right. And yeah. so they feel, you know, like my parents need the money more than I do and I'll figure it out. Yeah. Obviously, that's not what we tend to think about when we think about financial aid, but that is the no. reality for an increasing number of students. Mm. We're here today with Jennifer M. Morton talking about college and upward mobility and the hidden costs that can often be associated with those things. And we're not done yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. If a kid or a you know, young adult gets into a situation that they've been told is going to be awesome, it's going to be great, and things don't meet those expectations... They might think it's something to do with me. Well, if you're around people who behave a certain way a lot, you are going to end up yeah. behaving that way some or thinking it's okay to behave that way. And sort of realizing that I think can be helpful in helping you figure out, do I actually want to be in this institutional space for a long time? If you, as you said, you don't know exactly what your core values are or you're not entirely sure what you stand for, you might just by happenstance end up in a social group, you know, especially that first year of college where you're just yep. trying to make friends, trying to fit in. Totally. You might end up in a social group that is really counter to values you hold mm. deep, but you might just want to have friends and haven't really thought about it that much. I think it's really important that we affirm the experiences that students and young people are having and not dismiss them. So I think the first thing that happens sometimes is that, again, talking about well-meaning parents and college counselors and whatever will say, well, you know, you'll make new friends when students mm. are talking about missing their friends or missing yeah, their home, right? Yeah. Or like, you'll be fine. You'll right, get over You'll it. make new friends you'll get yeah. over it you'll meet new people right. and sure you know like that's it's not that that's not true uh it, it is true sure. but it's a way of dismissing the very real loss you know it is important and valuable for them to stay connected to the people that they love to friends that they have to you know go to college halfway across the country or even down the street depending on the situation and so just kind of like affirming and being empathetic about that instead of trying to kind of paper over it and be like, you'll be fine. It'll be, yeah. it'll be fine. You'll meet new people. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get access to all the interviews I've conducted, as well as new episodes weeks before the general public. It's completely affordable and your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.